everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Crime and Coffee Couple. My name's Allison. And my name's Mike. Hi, Mike. Hello, Al. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. You look older than last time we did this. How dare you? At first, you were very surprised that I said that. I was like, what an ass. You guys, if you see this on YouTube, you should see the uh, the look she gave me. <laughs> uh, but that's because you are a year older. Well, I am. I mean, technically a week older, but you know, you actually went up in an age. So It's true. Yeah, You're 45, not lying. 45 and never been kissed. 45, feeling alive. Yeah. Um, my uh, voice is a little raspy because I did some karaoke. Like a crazy person. Oh, wow. We should post that on Instagram. It's really fuzzy um, image. It is. Maybe I'll ask my coworker if she can get a, a little better image. But uh, it's like when you have an Android phone sent to an Apple phone. It just Apple kills it, like, for whatever reason. But boy, were you rocking out. Yeah, yeah. It was a uh, uh, Limp Biscuit song, um, stuff, break stuff. Uh, Give me something to break. How about your freaking face? Something yeah, like that. I'm not, I, a, not a Limp Biscuit fan, so I, I don't know it. I am a huge Limp Biscuit fan, and I'm not ashamed to admit it, like I just did. Hey, you do you, boo. They make me feel something. I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah, now I sound awesome. I should like smoke. Yeah, you sound like a smoker. Yeah, I think I should smoke more often. Sexy. Thank you. I, I thought so. See, that's the first time it's like, you said who that. are you? Exactly. Who is this man? <laughs> so I, I can just kind of look at you once in a while, give you a little eyebrow. So uh, yeah, hey, if you're uh, if you're listening to us, you can go ahead and subscribe over on YouTube. And um, if you want to support us some kind of way, we've got uh, a link in in our show notes where you can kind of go to Amazon and look at some of the stuff we've mentioned and things of that nature, and go ahead and you know purchase something from Amazon. It gives us a couple extra cents, so that's really cool. But um, a free way is just like subscribing, uh, whether you're listening on a podcast or listening on YouTube or watching on YouTube. And uh, if you have a couple extra shekels, you can go ahead and support this little mom and pop podcast. I'm Pa. And I'm Ma. Yeah, I'll go over to Patreon or Apple subscriptions and uh, throw us a couple shekels and, uh, you know, call it a day. So Yeah, you get if to, you want bonus episodes, you too. You also get bonus episodes. It's not just about the support. You know. Exactly. Although we do appreciate it very, very much. And then also, if you would like to give us a review, a five-star review is always appreciated. That's all we'll accept is five stars. If you don't have five-star <laughs> review to give, then please tell us how we can improve. And I honestly, I'll probably just ignore it because we'll just keep on doing the same thing. But you can tell Well, us. that's not very kind. Well, it's kind. I'll listen. I'm not just going to tell them to shove it in their wazoos. Well, or everybody's open for suggestion. Who even knows? Pound sand. I, I won't do that either. So it's fine. Um, but I, I will. I want to want to talk about one thing. I, as I was walking in here, I was reminded that um, I, I've been pitching a lot, doing pitching practice with our son. And I took like three different balls off of like my shin, my calf. Uh, I've been really well. Just you getting... were the catcher; he was the pitcher. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he was pitching. I was catching. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Thank you for for uh, laying that out there. But yeah, I I've just been getting hammered, and it's been like my I, I don't know what it is. Like you asked me today, you're like, are you okay? Because I get infected pretty. Easily. Yeah, he does. And we have a vacation coming up in a couple of weeks, and I'm like, listen, dude, you got to get yourself together. If you need IV antibiotics or something, I'm gonna leave you on the shore. I'm cruising off into Mexico. Because you're very much looking forward to it. If I don't go on this vacation, I might end up in a mental institution. And I don't mean to say that flippantly. I shouldn't. Yeah, really. What but I'm so insensitive and I apologize. I'm sleep deprived. I apologize I am for overworked. it overworked. My coworker is on vacation. We are severely short staffed. Wah, wah. I know. But it, it was a, a horrible week. Yeah. So oh. I'm hanging on by a thread here. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I, I need you to take care of yourself. I will. Don't worry. We're gonna still going to go. So it'll be all good. But I uh, just want to let you people know I'm going through some pain. And you might even be able to see it on the YouTube. Nobody oh, yeah. wants to see Look your nasty right sores. This was just called, caused from a baseball. Well, you know, our a kid baseball is pretty big. Our 15-year-old He's a big boy. He's big about guy. six feet, probably 180-something, so, 170. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a big fella. Um, but yeah, I, now, I, now I wear shin guards. Yeah, don't don't show your nasty ass leg. It's pretty gross. Sorry. All right. <laughs> so if you're ready to do this. I am. All right, so I talked to you about this case. Of course, I never gave you any information, but I said it is very, very mysterious. I believe I may have heard of this case on, I, I know I've heard of it. I don't think I've actually heard an episode on it. It is a very popular case. It's very sad, but it is very mysterious. This is the mysterious death of Phoebe Hansjuk. So it was the evening of Thursday, December 2nd, 2010, and a concierge within the luxury Melbourne, Australia apartment building headed to a ground floor garbage or refuse room in search of a broom. So this person is attempting to open the door, but it seemed as if something on the inside of the room was obstructing the door from opening. So she began to push and push, and after several attempts, she was able to push the door open. A few of the things I read or heard said she looked through the window of the room and saw something highly disturbing. 
So here she was met with a horrifying, tragic, and sad scene of a young woman lying in a pool of blood beside a garbage bin with blood streaked around the room. Mm. So the woman, sadly, lying on the floor was 24-year-old Phoebe Hanstruck. And she lived in this apartment uh, building. She lived 12 floors above on the 12th floor with her boyfriend, Anthony or Aunt Hampel. So she had plummeted 40 meters or 131 feet from the 12th floor to what appeared to be her death down the garbage chute. So it was clear that Phoebe had survived the floor as you could tell she had been able to get out of the bin that she would have fallen into. However, the compactor that was at the bottom of the chute severely injured her and sadly nearly severed her right foot. So she sadly bled to death. You could tell she was probably trying to get to the door. The room was dark. She could see the slip of, you know, light underneath the door. So... Sadly, she tragically bled to death in the darkness of the room, all alone amongst other people's garbage. That's got to be so scary. Like, you survived the fall, and then after that, you hear the machine turn on. I mean, just like that, the first thing that comes to my mind is Star Wars, you know, where they're in, mm-hmm. inside that trash compactor. They think they're about to be crushed, except poor Phoebe actually was, and that's horrible. But the very big question is, but how had she gotten into the chute, and why? Right. So Phoebe Hansjock was born on May 9th, 1986 to parents Natalie and Dr. Leonard Hansjock. He worked as a psychiatrist. She was the older sister of two brothers. This was Tom and Nikolai. She was described as a wild child who was easily noticed and not because she sought out attention, but just because she had this amazing presence that couldn't be ignored and it didn't hurt that she was truly beautiful. So Phoebe was very active. She was athletic. She loved running, martial arts, and she truly felt peace near the ocean. During her time in school, she was very popular. She had a very big social life and a close group of friends. Natalie and Len divorced, and sadly, excuse me, sadly, when Phoebe was only 14, she turned to drugs and alcohol in order to cope with her social anxieties and depression. So she was using speed, ecstasy, and marijuana during these times. I believe she may have dabbled in cocaine. So at age 15, she ran away from home for eight weeks. She later told her mom that she lived with an unknown male who had just been released from prison. And he was she was living with his partner and their new baby. It was not a good situation because after an incident of domestic violence between the couple, Phoebe ended up leaving their home and coming back to live with her mom. And then when she was 16, she had a relationship with a teacher who was in his 30s. So clearly she was drawn to older men. So because Phoebe suffered from depression, she was being treated with medication as well as counseling to assist her. Although her grandmother did say that Phoebe would often stop taking the medications once she started to feel better. She felt things very deeply. She was very sensitive, caring, and compassionate. She had a fierce sense of justice. So if she saw people being wronged, it really hit her deeply. So those that were close to Phoebe knew that they could always count on her since she was very protective of her family and her loved ones, especially had a close relationship with her grandmother, Jeanette. She would confide in her and be very open and honest with what was going on in her life. She had big aspirations for her future. She hoped to one day travel abroad and provide aid work in India. When Phoebe was 23, she took a job as a receptionist at the Lindley Godfrey Hair Salon in South Yara, and this is where she crossed paths with 39-year-old Aunt Hampel. Aunt was not only a customer of the salon, he was also a very prominent events planner. He surrounded himself with very wealthy and attractive friends. He was the son of Supreme, excuse me, Supreme Court Judge George Hampel, and his stepmother was County Court Judge Jelic- Jelicity, good Lord Almighty, Felicity Hampel. So very prominent people. Yeah, big deals. So after dating for about six months, it was October of 2009, and Phoebe moved into Aunt's home. This is the Balencia apartment uh, building on St. Kilda Road. 
This is a very luxurious building. It held 84 apartments. It had access to amenities such as a heated indoor pool, sauna, spa, steam room, gym, a 24-hour concierge service, as well as an Italian restaurant. Wow. And an average price of a unit inside this building is about a $1.5 million. So it's obviously a very nice place. Yeah. So some were very skeptical. Uh, skeptical. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's been a week. She's going to make a lot of mistakes. She's got. <laughs> she's a little tired. That's okay. So some were skeptical of the relationship because they were very different people, including Phoebe's mom. She thought this was going to be just a little blip on the radar. They would have their fun together and then go their separate ways. They had a very different background, and many wondered what brought them together. Some of Phoebe's friends felt that she did begin to drift away from them as she became more involved in her relationship with Aunt. Others indicated that Aunt was controlling and Phoebe really didn't have a voice in the relationship. So again, she's 24. He's edging on 40. That's a big difference. Yeah. Very big difference. You know, he's established in life. He's got this career. He's got these influential parents. Phoebe's just starting to learn her way in life. So. You know, what I always think about is uh, your like pop culture references. Right. It's like uh, the movies you grew up with are totally different. And like some references, somebody might not even get, you know, you're used to uh, referencing certain songs and certain right. lines for movies. And it's just like, no, I, I don't, I never saw that. Movie. It's like, it falls flat on me. Cause I don't listen to that. Yeah. Phoebe sought a simple life that was immersed in her love of the arts. And she did love the art. She was talented at drawing and such. She cherished experiences and connection over material possessions. She lived a bohemian lifestyle with a love of travel, whereas Ant was more accustomed to a life of luxury. He often attended very extravagant parties. That was part of his work. Is a bohemian lifestyle like moving? and Yeah, just, just kind of like doing your own thing. I think yeah, of my wandering. cousin, Kristen, and I know she listens to this, but, you know, just very artsy. She has lived in like, what, California, uh, New York, um, the Dakotas. Yeah, like, and people like place. that are very interesting to talk to. Because they know a lot of different things. They've yeah, seen a lot of things. Exactly. Whereas, you know... Ant is more focused on his business and, uh, you know, going around with people of high society. And his parents are, you know, affluent people. I, right. I think Phoebe's did well, too. Obviously, one of them right. was a doctor. For but sure. at the same time, like, you know, Ant grew up in a place where they were like the head of society, basically. Right. And, you know, Phoebe has a lot of social anxieties and she would be expected to accompany Ant to these parties and such. And it just was never a comfortable thing for her. I can relate to that. So his world revolved around maintaining an impeccable image that upheld his family's reputation. So the relationship between Phoebe and Aunt was very tumultuous, and she left him four times in the last six weeks of her life. Mm. But somehow Aunt always managed to convince her to return. Four times in six weeks is a lot. It is a lot. I mean, you can't even go like two to three weeks without breaking up again. That's, yeah, that's pretty bad. very rocky. So during these breakups, the couple would separate for, you know, maybe two to three days at a time. Phoebe would leave and she would go and stay with family and friends. She confided in her family as well as her therapist that she could just truly never feel like she was living up to Anne's expectations. And that's that's a crappy, crappy feeling yeah. to feel like you're not good enough when that's your life. So it appeared, you know, that maybe his behavior toward her was both emotionally and verbally harmful. She was concerned that Anne's controlling nature was isolating her from those that she loved, which was only exacerbating her use of alcohol in these last weeks of her life. It was worsening her depression. And that's honestly why I stopped drinking. It was making me so anxious. And then I was feeling depressed. Yeah. I wasn't sleeping. And I'm like, why Why am I doing this to myself? So that's, that's why I stopped drinking. So according to Ant, he never asked Phoebe to leave, nor had he ever verbally or physically abused her. He said that when Phoebe wasn't drinking, things were great between them. And truly, the one thing that they would argue about was her drinking. He described her as a binge drinker. She could go weeks at a time without drinking, and then she'd go on a bender. So, um, you know, that was the sole source of the animosity, according to Ant. So the last week of Phoebe's life was filled with turmoil, and it began with a Skype call with her mother. This is Natalie. This happened on Sunday, November 28th. And Natalie noticed that Phoebe was on the call. She was in a darker room. She was surprised to see that her daughter was in Aunt's apartment because 
It was her understanding that they had split up again and that Phoebe wouldn't be there. So her mom did ask her. She's like, oh, you're back at aunt's. And Phoebe raised her finger to her lips, kind of like, I can't talk right now. He's in the other room. So they didn't really get to talk about it because it was clear that aunt was there. And she didn't want to talk. No. Yeah. So on Monday morning, now it's November 29th, Phoebe had her last consultation face to face with her psychologist. This is Joanna Young. She indicated that she had been drinking heavily for several days. With this, her mood was very low. She was very distressed about her relationship with Aunt. It was Joanna's belief that Phoebe was unhappy with the fact that she wasn't an equal partner in her relationship. She was also dependent on him. I think I read that she was paying him like $150 a month for rent. Not always, not consistently, et cetera. Yeah. So that same evening, Phoebe and Aunt went out to dinner with their friends. This is Matt and Julia Rockman. And during dinner, Phoebe confided in Julia about her struggles, her feelings, um, maybe about the relationship with Aunt. And he must have overheard this. He quickly shut it down. He did not want her talking. He didn't want her to discuss the relationship issues. Mm. And some people are very private. Yeah. I don't know. You know, it seems like the shutdown thing right away. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, try, I'm listening here mm-hmm. trying to see like, some clues. So the Rockman said that the dinner did end very abruptly. And apparently when Ant and Phoebe got back to their apartment building, they were in the car park of the building. They did have an argument at this point. Phoebe left. She was in tears. She called her friend Brendan to meet her for a drink at City Bar. And according to Brendan, they shared a few drinks. Phoebe was never out of control. Since it was a Monday, the bars weren't open late, so they closed early. They stayed for maybe an hour. During their time out, Phoebe's phone rang incessantly. And then records later show that this was accurate. That's usually a sign of somebody that's kind of controlling. So Ant had called Phoebe 27 times, and they really had only been at the bar for about an hour. That's that's a lot. That's a lot, yeah. So she became so frustrated with the phone calls that she ended up throwing her phone across the street, and in the process, the screen shattered. So Ant later indicated that the reason why he had called repeatedly was because he was desperate and very worried. That was it. Okay. So Phoebe eventually ended up at her mom's house at about 12.30 a.m. I don't believe her mom was home but phoebe spoke with her mom's partner this is russell and um they were just talking about her relationship issues and the things that were going on in her life russell did note that phoebe was drunk but she wasn't incoherent she was having you know a productive conversation so they spoke for hours and in that time phoebe said that she loved aunt to bits but she just wanted to leave him because of the way he acted when she wasn't at necessarily the top of her game. And at 3 a.m., Russell made up the bed and Phoebe went to sleep. So it sounds like he's a good, like, you know, partner to the mom because he stayed up till till 3. And then I think he had to get up at like 7 for work. Well, that's so I'm sweet. like, that's really nice. He noticed that she was in turmoil yeah. and just kind of like, all right, she needs somebody to listen to her. So Natalie and Russell were planning to host an 18th birthday party for Phoebe's brother, Nick. And this was going to be Friday, and this was the day after Phoebe was found in this garbage room. And it was something that she was really excited about. She was going to help with the decorations. It was going to be a large family event. Everyone was coming together. So that's another piece of the story that people ultimately ended up questioning. Yeah, because you're thinking about suicide, obviously. Right. And it's like, well, if uh, if she was going to off herself, then she wouldn't. She'd probably start. To, you know, pushing away from things and right. not be as involved. And again, she's saying, oh, I want to help with the decorations. Yeah. So she's actively getting herself involved in that. Yep. So phone records indicate that by Tuesday morning, Phoebe had returned to the apartment that she shared with aunt. He had already left for work. She spoke with him that morning and told him that she would be going to work. He later learned that this hadn't happened because apparently he spoke with one of her coworkers and she didn't go. They were looking for her. So he indicated that when she did, he did speak with her. She sounded wasted. Phoebe had been working as a receptionist three days a week at an advertising agency. But between October and December, her attendance wasn't good. She was very inconsistent. She would miss days of work at a time. So midday Tuesday, Phoebe called her psychologist and told her that she had been drinking. She was extremely distressed over her relationship and she was feeling, and the word she used was unsafe. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, her psychologist took that as potentially suicidal. 
So she felt alone and helpless. And they spoke for about 30 minutes and Phoebe began to calm down. Though Joanna felt that she was potentially suicidal, she did give her contact information for crisis lines, but then Joanna indicated that she had to go and tend to her other counseling sessions. So Phoebe told Joanna that she wanted to take some sleeping pills to sleep away her pain. And she ended up calling the crisis line that Joanna did give her the number to. This was at Alfred Hospital. But Joanna Young never truly did go on to follow up with Phoebe. This was definitely a point in the case because if you have somebody that is potentially suicidal, you can't just give a, a crisis line number. There's got to be a plan in place yeah, for, you would think. for what to do. Professionally, yeah. there, there'd be some steps involved. Exactly. So just before 4 p.m., Phoebe sent a text message to her grandmother, Jeanette. This is her grandma that she's very close with. She was reassuring her grandma that she was okay. She would call her the next day. Jeanette was aware of the relationship between aunt and her granddaughter as being very turbulent. She was often, or she viewed it as aunt being jealous of Phoebe's male friends. And Phoebe had only recently come and stayed with her grandmother and Malakuda. I hope I said that right. I looked it up. Um, that's where her grandmother was living. She actually thought Phoebe might stay and she found a job for her that would have worked out. But lo and behold, same as often happened, Phoebe got a phone call and she did end up going back. So she did tell her grandma that no matter how much she did, she felt she could never get it right in, in her relationship. So it's obviously she felt inferior. Mm -hmm. So that Tuesday, Phoebe also met up with some friends in Melbourne. She returned to her apartment late Tuesday night or in the early morning hours of Wednesday. It was about two, or excuse me, 12.29 a.m. We have a lot of exact times because the apartment building has the swipe access. Okay. So you can see when it was swiped. So Aunt said that she was quite intoxicated on that Wednesday morning, Tuesday night. She had the hiccups. She got straight into bed. She didn't even interact with him. So now it's Wednesday. This is Wednesday the day? Oh, sorry. The day before. Okay. So it's Wednesday, December 1st, one day before her death. Aunt left for work at 8, excuse me, 8, 11 a.m. And Phoebe, again, did not go to work. She did end up sending a strange message. And it's clarified that it was sent from her iPhone. Do we know for sure that she sent it? No, not necessarily. But it was sent from her iPhone at 1030 a.m., now, I'm saying that, also saying that she had thrown her iPhone on Monday night in a fit of anger, and the screen shattered. So there was a lot of question about that phone, because there was a question as to when Ant brought it in for repair, because he did. So that's where it was questioned, uh, if, you know, how that happened. When did he bring it in? Right. So, and I'll clarify that. Okay. There's still a little bit of confusion there. But so this message comes through at 1030 a.m. It was sent to aunt, various family members, as well as her boss. And the message is now commonly referred to as the tomato soup text. And you'll hear why. So it says, hi, family. I am in bed about to sleep. And when I wake, I will transform into the most incredible human being, not being, being you've ever seen. And then in parentheses, it says not. And it says, I will go to hospital. It's safer there. And I hear the special tonight is tomato soup. Delicious, nutritious. I love you all very much, but not enough to send an individual text. Sorry about that, but time is sleep and I must be on my way. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. So obviously her family is concerned, confused. I mean, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty off. Is, is that typical for her at all? It doesn't sound like it because everyone was alarmed. Because you know how like, okay, somebody, you know, you might get to know somebody and it's like, yeah, they send weird texts sometimes, especially when they're hammered or something. And so this wasn't typical for her. No, because even her grandmother, Jeanette, immediately called aunt and he ended up coming home at 12.40 p.m. that day, Wednesday, because Jeanette asked, could you please go and check on Phoebe? And he did. He found her asleep in bed. And when he woke her, she told him that the night before she had been drinking, she had also taken ecstasy. I was going to ask if there were some other drugs involved. So. Yeah. Okay. So she had taken ecstasy. Sleeping pills ended up being in, involved. And I did mention that when she talked to her Sheesh. counselor. Yep. Um, she told him that she had taken two sleeping pills. She was going to go back to bed. So the Sleeping pill in question has several names. In Australia, it's called Stillnox. Here, it's called Zopadem, which is Ambien. So okay. when I'm saying sleeping pills, it was Ambien. So she said, you know, he's there checking on her. She's like, I took 
two sleeping pills, I'm going to bed. We knew a guy that uh, took Ambien for recreational purposes. Yeah. And kept it, kept awake and it gave him all kinds of fuzzies and something. I don't know. Yeah. And we will go on to say what the side effects can be. But I had been prescribed Ambien when I was like having these panic attacks after my pregnancy. It was not good. Um, I took it for a very minimal amount of time, but I was doing things in my sleep. Yeah. I wrote a blog post you and did. I was sleeping. Yeah. Very scary. That was the, f the last time I ever touched it. When I read the, it was well written. <laughs> well, yeah, you're still you. It's unbelievable. I mean, that's, that's another reason why I don't drink alcohol. I like to have my wits about me and in be in control, not doing things in a blackout. Right. So that does come back around. So she was going to go back to bed and he did end up taking the remaining sleeping pills that were there with him when he went back to, to work. He believes he did bring him, bring them back home with him that evening. And did she like text anybody else or call anybody else or anything like there that? There was no word about that. She sent that strange message. He went back and checked on her. Okay. So Jeanette admitted that when she received the strange text, she had been very worried about her granddaughter, but aunt assured her that Phoebe was sleeping peacefully and that he said specifically specifically now was the time to heal and then when she feels okay we will work it all out in a plan so she would go through these um like binges where when she was in a binge and drinking excessively she would be very low in her self-esteem and it would last for x amount of days and then she would start being healthy again and more productive and happier so everybody's used to the cycle yeah the cycle I, it was getting worse though towards the end of her life so they were going to work it out. According to Aunt, when he got home from work on Wednesday evening, he found that Phoebe was still in bed. He felt that she was still hungover. She was in her self-loathing mode and in the cycle that she was in. He brought up their upcoming trip to Paris that they had planned, hoping to kind of perk her up. He showed her the tickets for the trip. He said she was excited. He cooked dinner. She took a bath. She took some vitamins. And then she went back to bed and slept through the night. So on the day of Phoebe's death now, it's Thursday, December 2nd, 2010, swipe records show that Ant accessed the building's gym at 8.13 a.m. and then he left for work at 9.01 a.m. He indicated that Phoebe was sleeping peacefully with her dog Yoshi when he left. And then Phoebe uh, kind of did her own thing when she woke up. It was about 8.45. She sent an email. She utilized the computer a couple of times. And the ultimate plan was that evening, it was going to be Aunt, Len, Phoebe's dad, and Phoebe. They were going to go out to dinner that evening, and they were going to celebrate Len's birthday. So she was doing just random things throughout the morning. According to um, references, Aunt said that he did try to call her for multiple times throughout the day. He called on the landline since her cell phone was broken and indicated that he had been unable to reach her. Aunt later explained that he took the iPhone to get repaired on the previous morning, which would have been Wednesday, and that would make it unclear as to how she would have sent that iPhone message. Yeah, so did you have it with you or right. what? So then he changed his story and said, well, maybe I misspoke and actually took her phone Thursday, so maybe she did have it on Wednesday. So... It, that's kind of still unclear. Okay. Phoebe also had a Nokia phone. Apparently, she utilized that mainly for phone numbers that she had stored. But otherwise, her main phone she used was an iPhone that Aunt had given her. And the Nokia phone has never been located. It's just gone. Hmm. To this day, that phone has never been found. Odd. So at 11.43 a.m., the fire alarm within the apartment building went off. CCTV footage showed Phoebe exiting the building with her dog Yoshi at 11.44 a.m. The alarm was false. She re-entered the building six minutes later at 11.50. This ended up being the last recorded image of Phoebe alive. Mm -hmm. In the video, she showed no evidence of being intoxicated. She walked in a normal manner. She returned to her 12th floor unit. She used the computer again to check her email. She listened to music. She lit some candles and maybe she slept. She did ingest alcohol, uh, likely vodka. At some point in the day, she dropped and shattered a glass because there are remnants of this broken glass in the apartments. She attempted to clean it up and, you know, we're putting the pieces together based on what we see in the apartment. She cut herself in the pro in the process. There Jeez. are blood spots in the apartment. The exact details of Phoebe's activities between the hours of noon and seven are unknown. 
But at some point, Phoebe entered the garbage chute during sometime during these hours, and this resulted in her death. So the building swipe information showed that Ant returned home through the garage door entry at 6.06 p.m. When he entered the apartment, he was unable to recall if the door had been locked or not. He remembers that their dog Yoshi greeted him at the door. He believed he smelled incense in the air, which indicated that Phoebe had recently been burning it. Sure. He found Phoebe's purse, her apartment keys, and her swipe card on the kitchen counter. The apartment was in disarray, even suggestive of a fight if you looked at it. So there was broken glass shards that were in the kitchen. There were two used glasses sitting on the dining room table. According to Ant, they smelled of vodka. The glasses were never examined for fingerprints. The contents within the glasses were never examined. A cushion had been ripped apart. Drops of blood were on the mouse of the shared computer. The laptop was open and Phoebe's Gmail account was open as well, but Phoebe was nowhere to be seen. In the bedroom, he said he described what he saw as a shrine. This was very confusing to me. It was some random ramblings on post-it notes as well as some photos. Mm. He, uh, her hair straightener was on, which, you know, indicated that she had been getting ready and we do know she had plans to have dinner with her dad for his birthday. So, I mean, maybe she forgot to shut it off. I actually thought about Phoebe the other day. I I had left my straightener on for 24 hours, but it was indicative that she was getting ready. So Ant sat down at the computer and he sat there between 619 and 634. He looked through Phoebe's search history, hoping to find any kind of clue as to where she was. So at 6.51, Phoebe's dad, Len, tried to call her on her iPhone. So obviously he didn't know it was broken. And he was just going to let her know that he was running late for their dinner, but the call went straight to voicemail. And her family found this very strange. Within seconds, like maybe 30 seconds, less than a minute, Len's phone rings and it's Aunt. And mind you, Phoebe and Aunt have been living together for about 18 months and he has never, ever called Len. So the fact that Len called Phoebe and within less than a minute, he, Aunt called him back. That was very strange to family. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe a coincidence. I don't know. Could be a coincidence. You know, he just got home. He can't find where she is and he might be worried or something. I mean, you would think that he would call her phone, although she doesn't have a phone. Maybe he would call her Nokia phone. I don't know. And he'd been home for close to an hour, about 40 minutes at this time. So aunt called Phoebe's father. Again, this is something he had never done. And he indicated that he had taken Phoebe's phone to be repaired The fact that he called so soon after Len had was just purely coincidental. He would have no way of knowing when Phoebe called or that he had called Phoebe. I don't know that you called. I I just happened to call at the same time. So he told Len that Phoebe wasn't home. He had not heard from her, but he was hoping that she would walk through the door at any time. And they ended up speaking for three and a half minutes. So then Len next calls Phoebe's mom, Natalie, to let her know, hey, I just talked to Aunt and Phoebe's not there, but her stuff, her her keys, her purse. So clearly she didn't leave. So she was immediately concerned. She, and it was a little weird because Aunt called me and he never calls me. Yeah. So Natalie was concerned. She called one of Phoebe's friends. This is Brenda, who she Phoebe did often turn to when she was upset. Brenda had not heard or seen from Phoebe since Monday night. Shortly after, Len called Natalie back now with the devastating news that their daughter was deceased. Wow! It, it all happened that? very fast. And how would he know? It, well, you'll you'll come to find out within like maybe an hour. Len got the terrible news of what happened. Mm. So you know, Len is being told Phoebe's body was found in the garbage room of the building's bottom floor. And was it like just happened to be checked at that time, or it was just so happened that the concierge at about seven o'clock, seven o five, went to go get a broom. Mm-hmm. So it yeah. was what you know, Len called aunt oh, at around six fifty. Yep. So or aunt called Len, I should say. So, you know, obviously they're just befuddled and devastated. And Phoebe's mom did say, you know, if I was told that Phoebe was found deceased and that she had just taken her life with pain pills or or some sort of medication, I, I could wrap my head around that. But this way, no. There was no wrapping your head around this. It's, I mean, 
uh, one, how to even fit down a shoe. And yeah. I will tell you, it's I watch so many videos. It's hard for me to even watch because I feel like anxious and suffocated by watching it. All right. So despite the fact that Ant found the apartment in disarray, there's bro broken, broken glass present, a cushion shredded, there's blood on various things. He sat down to have a beer and a cigarette. He made some phone calls. He ordered Thai takeout at 7.06 p.m. Weird. To the same restaurant that they were planning on going to for Len's dinner for birthday. Wait, so 7.06, does he already know about no. what happened? No. no. But he's just hungry. He's like, well, well, I'm waiting for her to come home. So what? how? Like, if you weren't home and I was planning on having dinner with you, I'd be like, assuming we're still going to have dinner. Right. The, I found that strange. Interesting. So you're saying, okay, it's not that the, the ordering, it's just like, yeah, he you're was, already assuming she's not coming home. Exactly. Yeah. I, I wonder, was she normally flaky like that, maybe? I, I mean, it didn't sound like it. So at 8.03 p.m., he buzzed the delivery man in, and this is where he was sounding, or he sounded the alarm. He said, hey, there's a large police presence in the lobby of your building. So as Ant placed that phone call for the Thai food, the concierge just happened to make the dis horrifying discovery of Phoebe's body in the refuse room. Despite her immense fall... Phoebe managed to climb out of the garbage bin and into the darkness of the room. And, you know, obviously she was in search of the exit, but she lost too much blood. So police arrived at the scene of the Valencia apartments at 7.20 p.m. The ambulance arrived at 7.30. But because police firmly believed that Phoebe was deceased, they would not allow the paramedics to confirm that she was dead. Like, They're like, no, look. she looks dead. Is that what the paramedics are for? To like confirm uh, death? Yeah, the paramedics, coroner, somebody's got to confirm it. So maybe it was more because it was a, like a crime scene, but still. So like, that was the reason. They said you could be disturbed, but then you're going to come to find a lot of things weren't done. Yeah, like the fingerprints and stuff. So to me, it's pretty important that you determine definitively that somebody is gone so that if they are still alive, you hear cases. There's a faint pulse. Right, exactly. Yes. Rush her to the hospital, you could save her possibly. So... They did not check her for any signs of life and the left the actual time of her death as indeterminable. It's even possible, for all we know, that she could have potentially still been alive at that point That's because sad. we don't know what time she entered the garbage chute. Right. Aunt did say it still smelled like incense in the air. So Phoebe was found lying face up in the refuse room on the floor a short distance from the door. She was dressed in a tank top and blue jeans with a wide leather belt. She wore no shoes or socks. Her sunglasses were on the ground near her body. Her jeans had shifted to below her thighs. This comes back around as very strange. Yep. The immediate cause of death was blood loss related to her severe injury to her right foot, which has basically had been almost completely um, severed, about two inches above her ankle. Mm. A smeared blood trail was found on the floor or wall where just so sadly she was pulling herself around the room. So it sounds like her foot was just sticking out of an area that was being, you know, Compacted. Where the compactor was. Yeah. So if it, her foot was just moved a little bit, it yep. probably would have been okay. Yep. Oh, gosh. oh, it just, it breaks my heart. So Ant said that when the delivery driver told him about police activity, he immediately went downstairs. He was told by police that they had found a deceased person and he indicated that his heart sank because he knew it was Phoebe. He identified himself. He gave a description of Phoebe and he went back upstairs on the instruction of the police. Soon police confirmed that the deceased person found was Phoebe and Ant said like basically immediately to police. I believe that as a result of Phoebe's depression and alcohol abuse, she took her life tonight. And this is something that the police went on to also quickly believe. So the coroner later concluded that someone of Phoebe's size, which is five foot five and 125 pounds, could have been able to enter the chute if she had wanted to. They also indicated that some of the injuries seen on her body, such as bruising, could have been inflicted prior to her entering the chute. They couldn't determine that. But there were no obvious defensive injuries seen, and no evidence or tissue was found under her fingernails. However, there were minor injuries to the back of her hands and elbows that could have potentially been defensive in nature. 
And some of them appeared to be like oval bruises that looked like someone could have gripped her. Mm. So it was assumed by the coroner that the blood found in the apartment was a result of Phoebe cutting herself when she was trying to pick up the glass that she had shattered, as well as the reason why she would have walked to the shoot room, the garbage room on the 12th floor, to discard of this bag of broken glass. However, they did a careful inspection of the garbage that was located below. Her garbage was never found. So no, she did not dispose of any garbage when she walked over to that garbage room. Did they look in the apartment and to try to find it? No, no? I, I don't know that no. if they ever found a, a bag of the broken glass shards. Interesting. So forensic testing showed that her fingerprints were not on the handle of the chute nor anywhere in the vicinity of the chute. That's insane, right? Makes no sense whatsoever. No. And I will tell you in the videos that I watched of people of the Phoebe's similar size trying to get in to test this, they were trying to grip everything they could. And I'll tell you more about that too. Um, what about like, you know, so many people touched the trash thing, I'm sure. Um, you know, is it possible maybe no fingerprints were left because there's too much oil on it already? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But if you if I watch if you watch the reconstruction of people trying to get in, they You'd were like trying to grip spot. the yeah, and there yeah. were they were nowhere in the vicinity of this shoot. Wow. And so as the detectives are like doing their job and and whatnot, they're standing in the the ground floor and a garbage bag fell through and they're like, oh, you know what? We need to secure these floors. Tell the residents do not enter your chutes, right. your garbage rooms. So then they. Stand Stopped it or enter the shoots. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's something that you don't normally see. Oh, no, okay, that's why this is so <sighs> weird. Like, this isn't the first thing somebody trying to take no. their own life would do. It's like the last thing. Yeah. So the other huge question is, how were her jeans found below, like down her thighs, where they're suggesting that she fell feet first? So only would your jeans be pushed farther up, right. not pulled down. Right. We have no answer to that. I mean, that's the first thing I thought is, you know, if you're going head first and something could get caught or something. There were some blood spots on the door to the 12th floor garbage room that I believe tested positive for Phoebe's blood. There was no blood in the vicinity of the chute handle or the walls around it. And she, we know she was bleeding. Her blood was in the apartments. Yeah. So the other question was her sunglasses were found on the floor of the ground floor refuse room. If you were walking to the chute to take your own life, would you put your sunglasses on your head? No. No. <laughs> so that was another confusing thing. So the toxicology report came back and indicated that Phoebe had a blood alcohol level of 0.16. She also had this Zolpidem, Stilnox, slash Ambien in her system. 0.16 is a lot. It is. It's a lot. So she was definitely intoxicated, no doubt. Yeah, hammered. So the Ambien level in her body was considered to be a therapeutic dose, which is 0.2 milligrams per liter. This is suggesting that she was using it therapeutically in the hours before her death. However, it could be indicative that potentially an overdose could have occurred many hours. So by that time, it was more of a therapeutic dose. Mm. So detectives found traces of blood on the 12th floor refuse room door, which was secured, as well as what appeared to be traces of blood in one of the two elevators on the concrete floor of the car park. Some of her blood? Yes. Weird. These two areas were, however, not immediately secured. Um, oh, yeah. Why would they be? So they never photographed it. They never tested the blood in these areas. Weird. Yeah. They'd never tested it. So it wasn't her blood? or We, what don't, we don't know. It was just some blood. There was some blood oh. in random spots. Okay. So at 9 p.m., this is only two hours after her body had been discovered, police made statements regarding Phoebe's death being a suicide. So they quickly made this conclusion. They approached the extremely distraught concierge, this girl who came across Phoebe's body, and told her not to be too upset because the girl had taken her own life. Oh, okay. like, I don't care what the nature was. I feel so much better. Thank I, you. That was a very odd statement. So odd. Like, I just saw a 24-year-old girl deceased in a tragic, mysterious death, and and I'm not going to be upset about it regarding it that. It doesn't matter how she it met doesn't her demise. Matter. It's, like, still pretty traumatic. So because of this quick assumption, police failed to collect the very valuable CCTV footage from the building. What? Yeah. Like, which, don't you want to at least see her? Like, see where she, her last spots where she was walking and stuff? So this could have potentially captured anyone else that may have been involved in this case. Did they have a camera on the 
where you put the trash. There were a lot of cameras in this building because obviously it's a luxury building. Sure. Where exactly they were, I don't know. Mm. So the manager of the Valencia Apartments, this is Eric Giamoro, he urged the police to take the system's hard drive because he felt it could be important for it to be reviewed based on the nature of how Phoebe died. Yeah, I mean, not, I don't even care about the nature. Like, anybody died, like, just review everything. Of course. Just in case. He was also aware of the fact that the building system operated on a two-day loop. So you have 48 hours, and that sucker's going to start recording new footage over the old. And he said that he told the police this. You know, you've got to take this. However, police left the building that night without obtaining the CCTV footage. The cameras were left running. Eric Giamoro was befuddled by this decision, and the police only mentioned that they would let him know if they needed to collect it to review the footage. On the other hand, Detective Sergeant Butterworth stated that he took the steps to obtain a copy of the building CCTV tape for the day. He later indicated that he had no knowledge of the fact that every two days it records over itself. Yeah, it's because you get in trouble. Idiot. So because of this, the footage from only three to four of 16 cameras was successfully retrieved, which led to the loss of critical footage. So anything that could have been helpful had already been recorded over. Yeah, and two days is so short, too. They should have at least 30. Yeah, I would but. agree. So what I guess was captured was only a small portion of the foyer in the building entrance, nothing hugely, you know, beneficial. So footage from an underground car park that served as a perhaps an easy escape route, this was lost. Phoebe's family were appalled when they learned that much of the footage had not been retrieved, and this included her grandfather, Lorne, who happened to be a retired detective. So he knows how things should be done. He's a, de a retired detective. He did this. Great job. So 18 months later, when police requested a hard drive in order to analyze the footage, Eric attempted, this is the manager, to retrieve it from storage, but it was nowhere to be found. He immediately reported the missing hard drive to police and there was a thorough inquest or inquiry looked into, but to this day, this hard drive has never been accounted for. And it's interesting that Ant, who happens to have two like high ranking very, parents, very much, you know, might be able to, you know, pay somebody or influence somebody mm -hmm. to remove this thing. Are we saying that that happened? No, not for we sure. We don't know. We don't know. There's no evidence. Power that I know of. goes a long way sure in does. influence. It's a possibility. Photos were taken of the inside of the apartment in the 12th floor and ground floor refuse rooms, as well as the inside of the bin that Phoebe was believed to have fallen into based on the blood that was inside. Fingerprints were taken from all relevant areas. Phoebe's body was removed from the scene at 2.40 a.m. The scene was cleared at 5.40 a.m. Once back at the station, Detective Sergeant Butterworth handed the case over to the homicide squad, but again, they were basically already writing this off as a suicide. So despite the presence of blood on the computer, police did not take any of the phones or computers from the apartments. None of the electronic devices have ever been examined by police. It wasn't until two years after Phoebe's death that her family managed to gain entry to her email account. They discovered that every single sent email of hers had been deleted by somebody. Ooh, interesting. Phoebe's SIM card was also missing after detectives instructed Aunt to keep it. Gone. Whoops, I threw it away. Sorry, it's so small. I didn't know. Blood within the apartment was never tested for DNA. However, the blood found in the garbage rooms and on Phoebe's clothing were proven to belong to her. Large shoe prints that were leading away from the apartment were never photographed and samples were never taken of them. What about ants like phone records and stuff like that? I wonder if he'd call his parents because say like, you know, that'd be the first thing I would look for and then see, oh, it just so happens the police didn't do a thorough search of his apartment because they could be fired and the chief could be fired and whatever. And another thing happens in their family that I'll tell you about in a little bit that they make things just happen and disappeared. So, or disappear, I should yeah. say. So by the following Wednesday, December 8th, 2010, the homicide squad had written Phoebe's death off as a suicide without even conducting any kind of test to see if it was even physically possible for Phoebe to get into the shoot. 
nothing at all. You know what? Six days had passed. Nope. It's a suicide. Even though it's the first question in everybody's yes. mind. Can she physically do this? Right. So when Len and Natalie were told of how Phoebe died, they were baffled. They did not believe that if she were going to end of her life, would she have ever chosen this way to do it? No, no, no doubt. Natalie's partner, Russell, pointed out that Phoebe had been exceptionally excited about the 18th birthday party that was being held the very next day. And the fact that she was exceptionally close with her brother, she wouldn't have done that. So Lauren Campbell, this is now Phoebe's grandfather, who's a retired detective. He was immediately suspicious when he learned of the nature of his granddaughter's death and felt that the conclusion of suicide was premature. He questioned if she had been suicidal, just like everybody else. Would she have chosen this method? No. No, she would have taken like sleeping pills. She had and, sleeping pills. I mean, I guarantee she would be the, you know, probably one of her top three ways would be pills of some of sort, course. some kind of drugs. Lauren felt that the findings within the apartment, which included this cushion stuffing being like all over the place, broken glass, blood, that this was indicative that some kind of struggle had happened. There were two cups there at the sink with the liquid in. Did she have a guest over? And I don't know why Ant wouldn't have thrown it away if it was his, right? Or the wash didn't put it away? I don't know. At least it's just weird. Bruises were, again, found on Phoebe's body that could be consistent with an assault. It was his belief that the findings in this case were not consistent with a suicide or an accidental death, and instead, he believed that Phoebe had been criminally killed. In his testimony during the coronial inquest, Lauren also criticized the police for not seizing the phones or the two computers from Ant's apartment. Yeah. They had also not allowed for paramedics to examine Phoebe for signs of life, thus concluding definitively that she actually was deceased. Because Phoebe's blood alcohol level was 0.16%, he questioned if she would have even had the coordination to climb into the chute. She also had medication in her system that would have only worsened these effects. Yeah. Lauren said that despite the fact that Phoebe was fond of alcohol, alcohol was not fond of Phoebe, and she was very clumsy even after maybe a glass and a half of wine, wow. let alone 0.16%. Yeah, that's a lot more than a glass. So on January 28th, 2011, Lauren was granted access to the 12th floor refuse chute, and he went on to have an exact replica of the chute built with the assistance of the manufacturers of that chute. Awesome. Two friends of Phoebe's who were athletic, they were the same size as Phoebe, they were asked to climb into the model chute, which measured four and a half inches by eight and 8.6 inches. It sat on the wall. Four by eight four, inches? Uh, 14 by five inches. Oh, 14.5 inches. 14 and a half inches by eight inches. Point six inches. It. it is small. Yeah. It's sitting on the wall over like a, a little over three and a half feet off the ground. So there are no support structures in the vicinity. It's literally sitting on a wall. There's nothing you can just grab on right there. It was very, very challenging for them to do what they did. So this is Sarah and Viviana. They climbed onto the door of the model chute. Sarah was unable to pass through. And when I say they climbed onto the door, it was not easy. And they, the lady who was hosting the show that they were like recreating this on was very nervous. She was like kind of trying to help because they were afraid these girls were going to get hurt. Right. I was afraid watching. Of course. So Sarah was a slim girl. She was Phoebe size and she couldn't even pass through because of her shoulder width. Viviana did manage to get into the shaft, but with great difficulty, even with the assistance of Lauren and the host of the show. They were like, we shouldn't have helped her, but we did because we didn't want her to get hurt. They actually held the door of the chute open, mm -hmm. whereas Phoebe wouldn't have had that. No. Um, so the and not only, to mention, like you said, Phoebe was hammered and probably on some pills. And like, there's no way she would have done no, this. Not a chance. She definitely was intoxicated and she had the sleeping pill in her bloodstream. So the point th that to get into the chute, Viviana had to lift her hands directly up above her head. But you will find that this is not consistent with what the coroner finds in his inquest. You'll hear that he expected that she had her arms down by her side and was able to manage her fall down the chute. Oh, the chute's got to be bigger than the opening to the chute. It's, I mean, it's tight in there. Yeah. It's tight. So Phoebe's friend pointed out also 
that Phoebe hated confined spaces and could never fathom that her friend would have ever chosen to get into this confined space. Wow, man, there's so much information to say she wouldn't do this. Their tests established that it was possible. A sober person could possibly do it if they're at the appropriate size. Again, your hands would have to be above your head. But the fact that somebody with a 0.16 blood alcohol level plus therapeutic doses of sleeping pills in their blood, not a chance. You would think about it and then you would try. Be like, no, this isn't going to work. Not a chance. These are young athletic girls and they struggled so bad. Right. So using the shoot replica for the show, this is under investigation, a woman named Danielle, who was the exact height and weight of Phoebe and wore similar clothing as to what Phoebe wore on the day that she died, was brought in. Danielle immediately noted just how small the entry of the shoot was. She struggled terribly to get her butt inside the opening of the shoot. On her first attempt, her own weight actually broke the bolts that held the door in place. They fixed that. Um, So when that happened, her legs actually got trapped. So then they fixed it. And on her second attempt, it took every bit of her strength. She was panting and like very winded. Her, Her balance, her coordination just to sit inside the door. It continued to want to close on her back because that's what it does. It doesn't stay open. Right. And it did have tight spring locks like to, to swing back. It's just like scary hearing about that. It, it was very hard for me to watch yeah. because it. I felt claustrophobic watching it. Sure. Again, Danielle, a slender girl, she could only get through the shoot with her hands raised above her head. When she came back around, she was shaking from the endurance that she exerted. Again, she was asked, would you have been able to do this when you were drunk? She said, hell no, I would not have been able to do this. Like the only way you're able to do that is if you know for sure you have to prove it because like a friend of yours died or somebody you know died or whatever. Like that's the only way. Otherwise, she would have, Phoebe would have tried and been like, no, I'm not getting done. Especially with her arms at her shoulders, that wouldn't have happened. And I'm talking like multiple, because there's nothing you can just hold on to. So you're trying to get into something that's flushed to the the wall and the door is wanting to close on you right it's terrible yeah so the police believe it would have been easier for phoebe to climb into the chute herself rather than to have had a third party place her into the chute had she been unconscious however they never tested this theory anyway yeah and then of course lauren being the retired detective as well as a loved one of phoebe's conducted this i watched it danielle's body was able to easily be put into the chute had she like she hung as if she was unconscious this person this guy that was holding her opened the chute easily put her in there while holding it open wow. her body passed through very easily really lauren conducted that with that wow. girl danielle Amazing. so that just doesn't make sense whatsoever the other thing was they tried in the experiment to put the pants around the girl's legs and it actually helped because then her legs kept from spreading apart hmm. the whole idea that phoebe's pants were found below her like thighs doesn't make sense because again if you're going down a shoot legs first your pants are going to be pushed up not pull down. Right. So it was questioned as to how Ant could have gained access or anyone else for that matter into the building without a trace or a security swipe. But during the police investigation, they noted that Ant's family members and friends were able to enter the building and apartment without the use of a chip card. Oh, how about that? And really, they never generated any record from the security system. Interesting. So what happened was, if you'll remember, I said that there was a fire alarm that went off that day. It was not a real fire. Phoebe was only outside for, what, six minutes, I said. Because it had gone off that morning, the apartment block's security system was compromised. Mm -hmm. On the very day she would have done this. How, what are the odds of that? Uh, Very small. So, you know, that raised the question of the reliability of the system and the accuracy of a timeline that was provided by Ant in regards to when he came home. He could have been there longer. Totally. So in March of 2013, this is three years after Phoebe's death, her family was finally able to raise the $50,000 that would cover the legal fees of an official inquest into her death. And they hoped that with this inquest, that things that were overlooked could now be seen. And, however, was very much opposed of this inquest. Weird. His lawyers indicated that there wasn't enough evidence to suggest a homicide. 
The inquest took 14 days, and the coroner, this is Peter White, heard from 30 witnesses and reviewed thousands of pages of evidence with the assistance of a counsel. And one member of the council was Deborah Semenzma. She came to the conclusion that there wasn't enough evidence to determine if Phoebe's death had been accidental or deliberate and recommended that this stay open, that it could go back and be reexamined again. And however, Coroner White disregarded this recommendation. <laughs> nope. Interesting. So this coroner concluded that Phoebe's death was simply a tragic accident. Not suicide, but an accident. Not yeah. homicide, but an accident. Okay. She had a known love for climbing and undertaking physical challenges. So this was a factor in her decision to climb into the chute. And because she was intoxicated and under the influence of Stillnox, she was likely in a state similar to that of sleepwalking. So she wouldn't have thought about the repercussions of her injuries at the bottom of the chute and the fact that there was likely a compactor down there. However, in regards to the potential of sleepwalking with the use of like Ambien, Stillnox, whatever, otherwise um, toxicologists weighed in on this. And they said that with Ambien, yes, people do things while they're sleeping. These are things that are regularly done, like muscle memory things, eating, cleaning, me yeah. blogging. Like I, I was doing habits. that very habits. Okay. Climbing into a garbage chute, that is not a habit. Totally off the so wall. So that is not consistent with a side effect of Ambien. Okay. So that's that doesn't make sense. And again, you are pairing this with a 0.16 alcohol level, which is only going to make her coordination that much worse. So the coroner's report suggested that Phoebe entered the 12th floor room to discard her garbage in her intoxicated state. However, her garbage bag was never found. And here she made the ill-fated decision to climb into the chute despite the fact, again, her garbage was not located. His report also indicated that as she descended, she likely pressed her extremities into the sides of the wall with her butt pushed to one side in order to control her fall. And the reason he came to this conclusion was her internal organs did not have damage that would be expected in a free fall. Her liver, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, were all normal in appearance and didn't have hemorrhaging. That's interesting. So, so that's you know, a possibility that it was not homicide. Possibly. It was clear that she was conscious when she exited the chute because we do know she managed to get herself out of that bin and pull herself toward the, jo the door. Although there's garbage at the bottom, so that would break her fall, right? True. I mean, I'm sure they thought about that. True. But a lot of things were overlooked. However, in their experiments, the only way subjects were able to enter the chute was with their arms raised above their heads, which, you know, not at their sides, which would have made it impossible for them to control their fall. The lack of findings of dirt on Phoebe's hands, arms, and clothing was also suspicious. This showed that she didn't scrape her hands down the wall to control her fall because her hands would have been filthy. This chute has nothing but garbage. My parents oh. lived in a, in a, a condo in Florida. And the, the chute, like, stinks because people throw garbage down there all day long. Yeah, grease and yeah. sauces and whatever. So that didn't make sense either. Uh, the coroner, you know, again, deemed Phoebe's death nothing but a tragic accident. And her family was shaken and in disbelief with this decision. They tried to challenge these findings multiple times, but struggled to even find legal representation. They were informed that it would be very challenging to find a lawyer who would stand up against Ant's parents. Yeah, because they know they'd be career suicide. Phoebe's family will never stop believing that someone put her in that garbage chute and that she absolutely did not enter on her own volition. In addition to the coroner's findings that Phoebe's death had been nothing more than a tragic accident, Coroner White made one other significant finding, and this was requested by one of Ant's lawyers that he be exonerated of any responsibility of Phoebe's death, and this was granted. What? Yep. Oh. <laughs> how do they go from like, we don't know how it happened, it was an accident, to you definitely didn't do it? Yep. Uh, well, I know how because of his parents. After Phoebe's body was located in the refuse room, Ant gave his statement to police officers and officer, excuse me, officer Justin O'Brien noted that despite the fact that he was crying, there were zero tears coming from his eyes. Despite the fact that he's sniffling, there was no sign of mucus. His eyes were not bloodshot. There was no redness. His emotions seemed to turn on and off depending on the situation. His tears would suddenly stop, he would appear calm and composed, and then he would suddenly start to cry and curl up on the couch. 
Phoebe's grandmother, Jeanette, witnessed the same thing, and she said she felt like she was on a movie set. Ant's emotions were very bizarre. He also refused to officially identify Phoebe's body, and this then fell on to her parents having to do so, which is not nice at all. Well, they'd probably want to do that anyways. Phoebe's parents learned then that Ant applied to be recognized as her next of kin, which initially prevented her parents from even collecting her remains from the court. How was this that? was a struggle. When a local detective tried to seek assistance from the U.S. government to obtain Phoebe's Gmail records, he was denied since five days after her death, the case was closed after it was deemed a suicide, and U.S. authorities will only get involved in cases that are believed to be homicides, so they couldn't get that help. Mm. Following the coroner's report, Ant quickly applied for Phoebe's retirement fund and was going to receive a death benefit payment of $113,000, which he did receive. Oh, my God. And after several months of disputes, he gave the money to Phoebe's brothers. Okay. Because of the strain that formed between the families, two separate memorial services were held. Aunt's family chose to host one at a yacht club where many of Phoebe's closest friends weren't even invited. Aunt did not attend Phoebe's cremation, nor did he join her family in laying her ashes to rest. Phoebe, excuse me, Phoebe had been very close with Aunt's sister, Chrissy Hample, and she faced drug trafficking charges after Phoebe's death, and her family's influence and connections allowed her to evade a conviction with the court citing the potential for embarrassment to the family. So uh, this was the reason that they avoided any kind of conviction. That seems to be the big, like prevailing reason for this whole thing right it's like you know yeah we got to bury this sweep so that, it sweep it yeah we can't lose our status so in 2016 this is very mysterious chrissy posted an intriguing message in relation to phoebe's death on facebook and wrote i only hope one day that the truth will come out so maybe she knows something. Who's Christy again? Uh, Aunt's sister. Okay. Oh, wow. And she was very close with Phoebe. Oh, wow. Yep. That's crazy. So in 2018, Aunt, who was 51 at this time, had been dating a 25-year-old part-time model named Bailey Schneider. And they were dating for about nine months at this point when she was found unconscious in her parents' Melbourne home. Her parents said that just the day before she had been fighting with Aunt, they were basically on the verge of breaking up when they left to go shopping an hour or two before her death. So they left. Bailey was laying on the couch with the family dog. She was talking on the phone. It was clear that after they had left, she had poured herself a glass of wine. She had a cigarette. She was listening to some music on her Bluetooth speaker. She was found on the kitchen floor with a gold-colored cord tied tightly around her neck. Whoa. She never regained consciousness. Uh -huh. Aunt, Aunt was believed to be one of the last people who communicated with her before her death. There was no obvious spot in the kitchen where her body was found that she, being five foot eight, would have been able to affix a cord in order to hang herself. Well, sure. Yeah. Somebody killed her. Her death was ruled as self-inflicted asphyxiation. <laughs> what? It was determined that Ant was at an event in the city at the time of her death. Oh, was it like an, an official event probably with his parents there? <laughs> the toxicology report indicated that she had three times the legal driving alcohol limit as well as cocaine in her system at the time of her death. Wow. Similarly to Phoebe, Bailey also had transformed a lot during her nine-month relationship. She had started to isolate herself from her friends. It's, uh, Ant, it's a real piece of garbage. So this is the case of two suspicious deaths that were ruled suicides in young women. Now, again, the coronial inquest didn't say that Phoebe's death was a suicide. It was deemed an ac a freak accident. But regardless, these are two young girls, 24, then 25. Despite the passage of eight years, he stayed with the same age of girl. And uh, is it a coincidence or is something really shady happening here? I think we know what really shady is happening, and his name is A.N.T., and that is the sad and tragic, mysterious death of Phoebe Hanstruck. And then the other incidental sad death of Bailey Schneider. And what's Ant's full name? Hample. Ant Hample. Anthony Hample. Anthony Hample. So. Not Anthony. Anthony. Got it. So. Anthony Hample. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't want any 
powerful people that come out I don't want me, any but, uh, powerful people, but I worry. Well, who else is going to be a bystander? Yeah, if you're dating Ant, uh, I'd suggest you leave right away. Otherwise, you're going to be found um, you know, possibly in an accident or committed suicide. I, I would imagine that news would travel pretty quickly. So <laughs> they see their daughter in this kitchen and they're looking around like there's nowhere she could have done this. It, like it didn't make sense. She was on the, the couch an hour or so before. She was laying with the dog. She was talking. She put music on. She poured herself a glass of wine. She was enjoying herself. She was enjoying herself. Yeah. She was home alone. Right. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's pretty pretty crazy. And both situations are similar. I can't stand when the rich and powerful I, get special treatment. It just drives me absolutely batty. It sickens me. It sucks. So I'm so sorry to Phoebe's family and the other woman's family. It's so it's sad. It's so sad. Well, thank you so much for listening. We appreciate each and every one of you. And um, really uh, quickly want to say welcome to the latest members of the Crime and Coffee Couple Club. The latest and greatest. That's right. Um, oh, wow. I have such a pretty voice. It's really pretty. You should look into that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't think so. Oh, thanks. Welcome to Julie, uh, April, Scott. Brandy and Ellen, uh, thank you for um, you know handing over some of your hard-earned money. We really appreciate it. You guys each get some bonus episodes, and a I hope you them. enjoy those. Yeah, we have over sixty, I think now, or maybe over sixty-five. So yeah, if you're into some binging, um, if you're an Apple person, you can get free like three-day trial. Just go over to Apple Podcasts and click like you know free trial, and you can like try to binge all of them if you want. I don't know. I, you can do you. I don't know. Each of them are like uh, forty-five minutes to an hour, so yeah. you only have forty-eight hours in two days. If you have a cleaning project ahead of you that's when i put those earbuds in you know I... um allison people know when to listen remember you used to say that to me all the time you don't have to give them ideas of when to listen uh, yeah, yeah. But i'm saying to to binge oh okay. that's the difference you son of a bitch hey i just wanted to slam it right back at you so <laughs> i'll slam my fist into your head i hope you slam something in there. okay and on that note we're gonna go ahead and say bye and until next time bye, bye.